of Sada University. Um, you can take your seat up here. And um, I've got Professor Mirdad Shamlu on the, on, the, on, the pro, on this program, but on this program it's Professor Das. So uh, I think my talk, I'm, I'm Shamlu. You're, oh, you're yeah, Professor Shamlu, excellent. So my so talk is tomorrow. Your talk is tomorrow, excellent. Good. Thank, you, thank you for clearing out this confusion. I've got two conflicting programs here. So uh, anyway, I look forward to uh, introducing you tomorrow. So Dr. Yeah. Das, would you like to come up here? Yes, that's right. Thank you. So I've been asked to ask you, Professor Sharma, to say something about the conference. Okay. Well, this is an honor for me to say something about this Congress. I am associated with neuropharmacology since the last four years, and we have been so far very successful. And normally we have a large audience. But I think the uh, tradition will continue, and I'm happy to be associated with this Congress. They try to develop this network of uh, collaboration, and they also have a journal, and that's why they would like to publish the work. Of course, these are open access journal, and I don't want to comment on <laughs> the open access journal because there are many publications nowadays. So I hope that uh, like previous years, this uh, conference will also be a success and we will make friends and develop new collaboration. So thank you very much for being here. Okay. And so now I'll ask you, I'll introduce you, your background, so you people don't know exactly okay. who you are, okay, and then you can uh, okay. give your presentation. Thank you. uh, Professor Sharma is the director of, tell me if I'm wrong about any of this, International Experimental Central Nervous System Injury and Repair at University Hospital Uppsala, um, at Sweden. He's a neuroanatomist and an experimental neuropathologist trained in Germany, Switzerland, Hungary, Sweden, and the USA. And his current main research interest is the neurotoxicity of nanoparticles and the nanowired drug delivery of agents for enhanced neuroprotection from a variety of CNS insults or neurodegenerative diseases in relation to the function of the blood-brain barrier. That's right. Okay, can you? Uh, I'm not a PC man. Can you open this? Yeah. I think I will be able to successfully copy. Um, ah, okay. <laughs> you are very good. <laughs> okay. And then. For me to present some of our talks, this is a huge uh, program on nanoparticles and CNS injury and repair of drugs. This is supported largely by US Air Force Research Laboratory at the United States and Department of Defense. I don't have any pointer, so European Office of Aerospace Research and Development, Swedish Strategic Research Foundation, Swedish Government, uh, and also Harvard University, my colleagues are uh, from different organizations like University of Basque Country, uh, Spain, Italy, and also some of the colleagues from Far Eastern Federal University in Russia, and also uh, we are collaborating with the Russian Academy of Science. Okay. 
we don't have any point uh, because if I uh, try to use there this was point, there was one earlier. Let me just check. Yeah. Anyway, we should not lose our time. Yeah, it works. It's it's the one for it. Okay. 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 Well, I must say here that whatever I am telling to you, it is my personal opinion. It has nothing to do with any government organization with uh, whom we are working. Okay, we are working with uh, military uh, problems in various different countries and therefore I will talk about some problems that are currently being faced by uh, our soldiers in every part of the world, including the United States. So you know that uh, military personnel are often exposed to high altitude because either for combat operations or for uh, peacekeeping operations and then there are the problems. High altitude itself can produce many kinds of uh, neurological dysfunction including high altitude brain edema and therefore uh, as you can see here uh, in, in my slide, that staying at high altitude alone causes neurological dysfunctions. And the other problem associated with this, that often people try to use methamphetamine as a substance abuse, and they feel that they, they're quite good. So this is a large uh, US project. We are working on that. So I'm showing also some of the uh, observations here. And when these people get injured, the pathophysiological outcome is much more worse than normal cases. I show some of the data that high HCO severely affects brain function due to hypoxia and related vascular changes and brain edema. And here is uh, an example. But the research on uh, drugs of abuse at high altitude and traumatic brain injury is still lacking. This slide shows that uh, regional methamphetamine use among US Army personnel stationed at uh, continental United States and Hawaii. This is just an example showing that people are working on that. And these are just showing some figures that how uh, the people are using methamphetamine from 1980 to 2005. Active duty army these drug positives are shown here per 100,000 tests in 2000 to 2005 and as you can see that they are in, in reading here. And the main point is high LCU brain edema for injury edema, dizziness for cardio, adverse effects on traumatic brain injury and decision making capabilities. The point is that high LCU correlates very well with taking the methamphetamine and this is the research published in scientific, it's quite interesting that you can see here that the high altitude and consumption of methamphetamine. So therefore this is a real problem in the world. I'm showing you some statistics of United States and this shows you that the people at high elevated level like certain states in United States consume more methamphetamine than people at uh, lesser altitude. This is the official document of the United States military published in 2010 and telling that traumatic brain injury at high altitude is really a serious problem. Those who are familiar with uh, problems of high altitude, you can see that uh, Mount Everest is the highest and there are some other uh, mountains and you can see that lots of consciousness, dizziness and tingling at 4,800 meters and even at 13, 13 meters after 9 million. So these are the problems. And those who are familiar with uh, some of the uh, recent news and letters results, you can see that here the Hindu Kush mountain in Afghanistan is 6,000 meters and many of our soldiers are fighting at that level and they have so many problems. So, high altitude brain edema is 
relatively uncommon in civilian, but at worst it has a fire exclusion and we found 3,500 meters. Very high, over 5,000 meters. And when it was a injury at this time, there are real problems and we need to find uh, the normal medicine given for brain edema is not effective enough. So we need, we need to uh, study more about that. And, and these are uh, the main events here. Cerebral ischemia, brain herniation, neuroinflammation, they can occur following secondary injury at high altitude. And this is, I'm not talking about this vast evolution of trauma because this is another aspect of uh, medicine. And maybe uh, we can start to talk about that last time. So, as you can see, that exposure to very high extreme altitude, hypoxia, hypoxemia, and cerebral edema that would lead to elevated brain pressure and high altitude cerebral edema. Still, we don't have any uh, cure for that. So, we, we explored effect of methamphetamine exposure on traumatic brain injury on high altitude in the routine model, and we expect the barrier, brain edema, and we don't have damages. These are our parameters because these are the key for uh, brain health. So, previously we have shown that as a suggestion of methamphetamine, you know, is too cold and hot in the morning, I see that. I'll show you some examples here. You, you can see that uh, methamphetamine is a suggestion of methamphetamine and hot in the morning. So, this is uh, also a good and process and given. And this is one of the antioxidant drugs that tries to prevent the first and then one use, and this drives the activation. We have a model of fantasy uh, delivery where a rate of 114.6 grams per hour per hour in the skull, okay, and it produces 24 meter impact that is considered moderate head injury in terms of uh, monetary medicine. Uh, then we use this high altitude uh, chamber in the laboratory where rats were exposed. You can see that uh, rats were exposed simulating 5,000 meter and for one week and then in this country then we have a very and control animals at the laboratory normal Then another uh, group of rats were given 9 milligram per kilogram Subcutaneously methamphetamine. This is the dose sterilized by the Chinese shooter drug at the NIH in the States. And I can show you uh, briefly that what we got that the brain really at high altitude in methamphetamine showed two to three fold higher than the area leakage. And even at sea level, methamphetamine enhanced 0.5 to 1.5 fold greater than the area damage. So methamphetamine causes a preservation of uh, the injury. And here, you can see this, this is the one barrier, cerebral blood flow. Cerebral blood flow is also the in high altitude and much more increased. And then we have the horizon uh, here. And these are the brain in formation. And these are the number of uh, zone and uh, You can see this 128 versus 39. I'll show you another example because we are uh, using different types of drugs and then ovary. The question is which drug is more effective? The other question is can we uh, label any drug to one type of delivery like titanium? We can have a better effect. The second question is that the, the drugs which are most effective can be leveled not only uh, TIO2 but also other models of drug delivery can have equal effect. These are the pertinent questions we are working on that. So in this case, we use this antioxidant compound that is called S2951, developed by AstraZeneca. It is a chain protein uh, compound. And here you can see that uh, when we have uh, traumatic brain injury, on the right side, the left side shows more damage, indicating that counter to mechanism that is often found in the cases. At higher tissue, you can see that both right and left in your heart show much more damage than the normal cases. And when we have added methamphetamine, then you can see that reduction in blood flow was much more greater. 
and all other factors in human formation much higher. I can show you an example. So, so this is uh, the methane used high ambient temperature from the event You can see here that only few neurons are left and maximum AD minus one is there. Then we have given this antioxidant, uh, 150 grams per kilogram, which are just many force in a normal and normal. And you can see here that by this treatment, uh, the physiological changes are much less seen here. Even at high altitude, many neurons are close normal, many of two are definitely abnormal. So at this point, we can only say that uh, high ambient temperature, it's a high altitude can itself induce an edema and then pathology. These things are much more exacerbated when uh, taken by methamphetamine, and then we are trying to reduce it with this. Unfortunately, I cannot tell you um, while I submit the abstract, uh, the CEO's ministry is working on that, and uh, we are prevented to tell this result with cerebralizing and engine final stem cells. So at the moment I am refraining from that. When I get the permission, I can show you probably the text, but I can only say briefly without showing any data that when we have given uh, TIO to cerebralizing together with engine uh, final stem cells, we have also much better effect at higher altitude after methamphetamine exposure. But these results are uh, still working on, and I, I will tell you later. And these are our government organizations and other organizations who support us with and collaborators. And I am from Solar University. Thank you very much for your attention. And I look forward to getting questions and comments on this. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask Professor Shandu to say something in a minute, but uh, there's a couple of questions of clarification. I saw the phrase Evans Blue on one of your slides. Is yes. that a way of, of estimating how, much, um, how well the blood brain barrier is working by how much Evans Blue gets yes. through? Yes. Thank you. If it's not my area, so I just want to be okay. absolutely clear about it. And cerebralizing. Yes. What exactly is it? Is that an antioxidant again, or is it something completely different? Cerebralizing is a mixture of uh, different kinds of neurotropic factors mm -hmm. to gain derived, real cell derived and also a peptide fragment. This is chemically available from uh, uh, Austrian company called uh, Neuro Pharma mm -hmm. and it is very established and there are many drugs going on in the States and all other parts of the world for stroke, brain injury and uh, so we are exploring the skills, uh, not a single compound is responsible sure. Right. So we are using it. So that's why we came to the same sense. In your meta study, that was a huge thing. Yes. Non treatment, uh, we are not yet allowed. So the, the doses were used from uh, National Institute of uh, See the field that uh, the human consumption for recreation activity are used, they could be quite similar in rats. Of course, uh, it is very difficult to convert the drug usage from human to rats. But at the moment, we stick to this uh, similar. So, do you expect the chronic studies of chronic dosing with acetamin with at least the same results? Because there is this novel. Um, Chronic methamphetamine has shown to induce degeneration in the central nervous system, and both in human cases, because who are chronically exposed to methamphetamine, their brain damage could be equivalent to either dementia or Alzheimer's disease. I, I don't have those slides to show you, but they are very uh, similar mimicking neurodegenerative diseases. So we believe that. Uh, Chronic exposure is also much more harmful. And these were given my tools just to understand the whole issues project and we are looking at this. And uh, you haven't tested any other drugs of cannabis in the other plan? Very good question. We also have uh, this uh, MDMA, cocaine, and cannabis. But these results are still under investigation. 
And your results with the spin trap, the antioxidant you use, that was post treatment, right? Or pre treatment? Pre treatment. Yeah, pre treatment uh, normally for clinical usage is useless. So we uh, give all this post treatment, and depending on, for example, if our animals are surviving for one week, probably they are given after eight, 12, and 24 hours after the initial insert when the traumatic brain injury is concerned. And so that's a therapeutic window, eight hours different than <laughs> Well, well uh, this is quite feasible because uh, if our uh, soldiers are exposed at high altitude, they should uh, be brought down to the you know, first hospitals down, and it requires three to six hours. So therefore, we started doing it for eight hours. We also have the data earlier, but uh, uh, as advised by the US government, eight hours is fit in a normal window that we should expect. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I have a question. Uh, the doses were quite high. So it was 100 milligram per kilogram up to 150 milligrams per yes. kilogram, right? So if I consider soldier as a big guy, which has 100 kilograms, which is, I think, reasonable number, then the doses are incredibly high, isn't it? So is there development of some compounds where you can go to lower doses? Because... Uh, are you a physician or what? No, I'm chemist. <laughs> OK. Do you take paracetamol or ibuprofen ever in your life? Mm -hmm. Not a lot. <laughs> From time to time. No, <laughs> I'm just curious because like... No, what are the standard doses of uh, ibuprofen or paracetamol? Do you know that? Uh, no. I mean, like, I'm just asking because it's just... I'm just curious if there is a... So if this campaign... I explain, is so effective, I explain to you. Because okay. that's why I'm telling you. Uh -huh. The standard dose varies from different countries. Standard European dose is 400 milligram ibuprofen you should take at least three or four times a day mm -hmm. for human. Mm -hmm. Okay. Likewise, paracetamol, 500 milligram, you can take six tablets. Mm -hmm. So this is the dose who manufactured the drug is 50 to 100 milligram per kilogram. Okay. In rats, how much it comes? A, a rat body weighs it hardly 200 milli, uh, 200 gram. So all the doses were considered based on human cases. So if you are a physician or you can calculate the bioavailability of the dose, these doses are not high. Mm -hmm. I can only say. Otherwise, you should go and study or look for this bioavailability and transformation of these drugs. So these 100 milligram or 200 milligram per kilogram doses once or even two or three times in human cases is not high. These are standard doses and even antibiotics, you take 500 milligram for two or three doses. Mm -hmm. So try to understand uh, from uh, physician's point of view. Mm -hmm. I respect your question, but I have to answer in this way. This is not high. Okay. And the PO administration, did you try it? Or only IP? You can give PO, but this is uh, difficult how much it is going in, where it is going, uh, and how is the spillage, <coughs> because this is not the standard dose, but intraperitoneal is much better. Any other questions? Uh, I've got one. Uh, yeah. This was obviously, obviously some work you've done with rats. Do we, do we, do we have any idea how this particular substance that you use in humans in terms of bioavailability, in terms of how you might be able to take it? Uh, for the compound or yeah, for the compound? Oh, no, the compound. This is well uh, designed by AstraZeneca. So I think they have already done those experiments. And the doses that we received from the Astra company, there are okay. three papers published in uh, Pharmaceutical Journal. Right. So we don't question that. Yeah. Okay. okay, any other questions from anybody? Right, thank you very much, Professor.